the Chinese economy, as it evolved over the years, uh, contributed also to, to deepen inequalities uh, between rich and poor in China. So, so tell us a bit about these two trends. First of all, the first trend, you know, getting dozens of millions of people out of poverty. How did it happen? What were the policies at the core of this phenomenon? Uh, in order to explain this, I think we have to go a little bit earlier to an earlier period. Mm -hmm. I mean, when PRC, the People's Republic of, uh, of China, was founded in 1949, China was a very, very poor country, perhaps the poorest country in, in the whole world. If you use the UPEN uh, table, the world table, the data set, you will find out China from 1949 all the way to early 1960, China was ranked the lowest among all the countries which have data available. China was poorer than, for instance, uh, uh, East European, Malawi, uh, India, Pakistan, Uganda, all of those countries were richer than China in early 1950s. What happened in the 1950s through 70s was economic growth. After the foundation of the PRC, the economy began to grow. From 1949 to 1978, even before economic reform began, the average annual growth rate was 6.5% a year, which is quite respectable compared to even most of the country today. So for third, three decades, the growth rate was pretty high. Second, during the Mao's area, China had its first industrialization. In, at the beginning of the PRC, agriculture was a majority, was the main bone of the, uh, the economy. By the time economic reform began, industry already conform, uh, formed about 48% of the economy, the GDP. So China essentially finished its industrialization during the first 30 years. Third, China built infrastructure in the first 30 years, like road, um, uh, water reservoir, and uh, irrigation system. All of those was already uh, there in the first three decades. Number four is the human capital. Substantial improvement of human capital in the first 30 years, uh, namely basic education, and the basic health care. China's uh, life expectancy, for instance, increased from about 35 years old in 1949 to about 68 years old by 1980. And then the people with the literate, illiterate people used to account for about more than 90%. By the time economic reform began, that has substantially declined. All of those named a solid foundation for later economic growth. So I think the first reason why China was capable of take millions of people out of poverty was the economic growth. Not only economic growth during the reform period, but also economic growth even before uh, uh, economic reform. So economic growth, I think, is a primary reason why you know, China was capable of moving people out of poverty. But, uh, but so, Professor Wang, what you, what you said is very, very important because usually when we talk about uh, the, the Chinese miracle in terms of uh, getting dozens of millions of poverty out of poverty, uh, you know, we, we tend to think that this happened really uh, after 1978, but in fact these four elements that you that you uh, mentioned uh, uh, at, at the at the beginning of, of our conversation are really the element which allowed uh, the, the Chinese miracle post seventy eight to happen because they they built the foundations to really have economic growth to really uh, uh, explode uh, after seventy eight. Right. And the policy afterward was also important. Yes. The poverty was mostly the rural phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, the urban area people were not rich, but they are not in extreme poverty. But the people in the countryside was pretty poor, even in 1978. 
when economic reform will just begin.、Mm -hmm. So the first asset of the economic growth is the transfer of attention from the urban area to the countryside, especially、mm -hmm. in early 1980s. If you、uh, analyze the poverty data, you show、uh, you can see right away the poverty reduction happened. Most rapidly in the early 1980s, from 1979 all the way to 1984-85, that was in the period a substantial reduction of poverty, rural poverty,、uh, taking place. So, transition of the transformation of the the focus, the government policy focus, I think it was quite important. Another reason I think is the targeting the poor area. Some area of China was relatively well to do. Some area, especially central China, as western China, are pretty poor. So the Chinese government policy designate many poor area as a poverty area. So、uh, apply special policy to alleviate the people from poverty. All of those three factors, I think, it was very important in explaining. The substantial reduction of poverty in early 1980 all the way to now. And so you just mentioned that historically、uh, these are first and foremost rural areas、uh, which suffered from poverty in、uh, in China. And so you mentioned that between 1978 and 1985, really significant uh, uh, change took place in the rural areas. And in fact, that's where the the, the change.、Uh, The deep change happened. So, what was done、uh, in these、uh, rural areas to to change the the landscape of poverty in the course of these、uh, seven years?、Mm -hmm. I, I think the reason is, I mean, the government, for instance, increased in the purchase price of agricultural produce. So that is、uh, one mean to increase in the income of real rural resident. So that. Policy alone uh, uh, help many people in the countryside become、uh, moving out of poverty. I mean, mostly in the early 1980s.、Mm -hmm. Afterward, I think the most important uh, 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 factor or two. One is the economic growth in general. Second is the designation of poverty area and apply special policy to、uh, in helping those area. Uh, in the later year, so those two factors explain the、mm -hmm. reduction in the later years. And, and, and so, to alleviate poverty in rural areas, so increase of、uh, agricultural prices was a key factor. And then,、mm -hmm. beyond these rural areas, so the designation of、uh, poverty areas was important. And, and what was done in these uh, uh, designated、uh, areas of poverty to really change things? I think mostly use、uh, kind of a transfer money to help in the local、uh, area. Some 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 er、uh, poverty area was not quite a humanly livable area. So、mm -hmm. one、uh, uh, policy instrument is just physically move those people out of the area、okay. to some、uh, livable area. This、mm -hmm. has been the case, especially in the last few years. I mean.、Uh, The last spots of the poverty area tend to be those area which are not livable for human being. So、mm -hmm. that's become one policy instrument. And, and so these are these are policies which took place between 1978、uh, all the way to the late 1980s, basically, right? No, it's all the way to now. All the way、oh, to now. All the now. way to now. All the way to now. In 1978, official figure by official definition, the people living、uh, below poverty line was 250 million people,、uh, just about、uh, more than a quarter of the、uh, population.、Mm -hmm. By now, it's down to about 25 million people.、Mm -hmm. 25 million. And uh, uh, remember. The official criterion of poverty has increased. So、yes. now we are using a higher standard for the poverty. Even using a new standard of poverty, the number of people living below poverty line is substantially lower today 
than 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, so in your in your analysis here, you mean, you you mainly refer to uh, rural areas. Yet, you know, in the West, when we talk about the the Chinese uh, economic miracle, we tend to focus on on uh, on two things: uh, the, the the coastal areas, and then uh, you know the boom of urbanization and so on. So, where does it you know come into the picture? This coastal area development and the boom of urbanization. Right. Right. Uh, uh, later, when we talk about the inequality, we can talk about the, 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 the huge gap between coastal area and inland area. Mm -hmm. uh, coastal area uh, uh, was relatively well to do, even historically. I mean, a uh, hundred years ago, they are already much better uh, in a much better position than the people in the inland area. So this has uh, has been uh, the case historically. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the beginning, in the early years of economic reform, the gap between the coastal area and inland area was grow, yes. was growing, and uh, due to a number of factors. And uh, so, uh, the book, my book, Political Economy on Even Development, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. dealt with the regional disparities. Okay. Uh, for instance. Uh, uh, the per capita GDP in Shanghai was about 14 times higher than the poorest province in China, Guizhou. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, many people have a wrong impression to bet is the poorest uh, province in China. That's not the case. The poorest province is, is a Guizhou province. So Shanghai's per capita GDP is much higher than in Guizhou, and it's growing in the early years of economic reform. Mm -hmm. So, so you just alluded, alluded to, to the to the two trends that I mentioned earlier when we began our conversation. The fact that in your work, you know, on the one hand, you know, you pinpoint uh, or you identify the policies which led dozens of millions uh, of Chinese people to get out of poverty, and yet at the same time, a number of policies deepen inequalities, and these, these inequalities uh, uh, are not simply between rural areas and urban areas, but they also have to do with uh, what you call regional disparity. So tell us a bit yes. about these two layers of inequalities between rural areas and, regi and, and urban areas and also regional disparities. Right. The China, uh, before economic reform, China was perhaps one of the most egalitarian uh, society. I mean, it's a very equal. The GDP coefficient, the measure for inequality, was extremely low, even below 0.2. It's very low, but by 2005-2007, China became one of the, the most unequal society in the world, uh, only better than perhaps some uh, Latin American country, like Brazil uh, uh, and those countries, Latin American country, and some African country. So China became from very equal society to very unequal society. Why? First of all, we have to understand the, the, the feature of inequality in China is a, a, perhaps different from some another society because China is large, very diverse. So at least the four dimensions of income inequality. The first dimension is regional. Some provinces are much richer than another provinces. It's regional. Shanghai versus inland provinces, especially the poorest provinces in the West. In the West. Second dimension is a rural-urban divide. So the gap between rural resident and urban resident. The third dimension is inequality with among the rural resident. Mm -hmm. And the final dimension is inequality among urban resident. So mm -hmm. if you go to any countryside, any uh, in the rural region, internal inequality may not be that large compared to the uh, situation elsewhere in the world. If you go to any city in China, internal inequality may not be that large. But if you add all kinds of inequality together, China becomes extremely unequal. So in 1990s, in my view, the most significant factor 
contributing to the overall inequality was regional inequality. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote, I and my colleagues wrote three books on regional inequality. If this dimension of inequality somewhat diminished, the overall inequality should be much better. So that's why I, I focus on the regional uh, yeah. dimension in the early years. And, and but so so uh, uh, these regional inequalities, I mean, you know, I guess that they are uh, partly a legacy of the past and of the way, in fact, the Chinese, uh, uh, I mean, China was built as a coherent uh, political entity. So so give us example of, of these uh, regional inequalities and tell us how precisely these uh, regional inequalities came to be and are partly um, uh, a legacy of the past and how, you know, uh, after 1949 and then after 1978, there were attempts to tackle these uh, regional inequalities. Uh, unfortunately, in the early years of economic reform, government policy was not to tackle the inequality between regions. Rather, government purposely promote the, the growing gap between region uh, between regions between coastal area and inland area at that time chinese leader believe uh, in order to reduce poverty you have to promote economic growth in order to promote economic growth you need to allow some region some people become rich first than others Mm -hmm. So that's become the orientation of policy, official policy. Po government belief, one in early stage, is perhaps okay to to allow the gap become bigger. Only later, when the economic pie become bigger and bigger, then everyone will benefit from economic growth. So in government intentionally, intentionally promote the, the gap rather than reduce the gap in early years. Mm -hmm. I emphasize in early years, from late 1970 all the way perhaps to late 1990s. Mm -hmm. That's in the government policy. Yeah. And uh, remember in the 1980s in Great Britain, in United States, there's, there's a saying called trickling down effect. Yeah. People believe in the trickling down effect, and some Chinese leader perhaps also believe the trickling down effect. Mm -hmm. Once the pie mm -hmm. become bigger, everyone will benefit. All problem will go go away. So that's their belief in the early years. So Reagan policies had also somehow uh, an impact on uh, on on what was at the time the thinking of uh, Chinese leaders. Right. Right. I, I, if maybe they don't, uh, they're not affected by Ronald Reagan or Mrs. Thatcher, yes. but some of what yes. they develop more or less the same mindset around mm -hmm. the same time. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, remember uh, Milton Friedman visited China in 1986-87. He mm -hmm. talked to China's prime minister, and also in 1980s, uh, the, the, the conservative think tank in the United States, Cato Institute, mm -hmm. sometimes advise the Chinese government on its economic policy. So there may be some influence from the West, mm -hmm. uh, the trickling down effect among the Chinese mm -hmm. leaders. So initially, initially, in the early years of, of reform following 1978, so the, the disparities between regions, uh, in fact, uh, deepened. And, and, and uh, when did it start to somehow get more even? Um, it, it, it's another, I have to analyze another factor contributing to the growing gap. Mm -hmm. Another fact mm -hmm. is the Chinese government in 1980 all the way to middle of the 1990s have diminishing capacity of taxing okay. to take collect taxes okay i call this extractive capacity of a state mm -hmm. and this kind of a capacity was substantially weakened in 1980s 
all the way to the middle of the 1990s. In 1978, for instance, the government tax revenue accounted for around 34% of the GDP. Mm-hmm. By 1995, the government, the government revenue only accounted for about 10% of the GDP. Mm-hmm. Here, I mean not only central government, but a government at all level. So government at all level only collect about 10% of the GDP. So this is extremely low mm-hmm. compared to most of the OECD countries, compared to France, compared mm-hmm. to Sweden, even compared to United States. United States government collect at least one third of the GDP. Mm-hmm. Even compared to most of the developing country, developing country normally collect 25, 30 percent of GDP. But in 1995, when the government was only capable of collecting 10 percent of the GDP, central government only have 4 percent of the GDP at its disposal. You know, in elsewhere, one of the functions of government is to redistribute resources from rich to the poor. But when the government has no money at its own disposal, there's nothing to redistribute. So that's another important fact explaining why the gap was growing in 1980s and 1990s. And and we'll go back to this uh, taxation issue uh, later in the conversation because, as you point out, it's very, very important. But just uh, an aside question, if you will, why is it that... uh, uh, at one point, uh, the taxation capacity of the Chinese state was so low. What, what happened? A uh, number of reasons. One reason is that the central government wants to give the lower level of government more incentive to collect taxes. So Chinese government introduced a kind of a tax contract within mm-hmm. the lower level of government. So lower level government only need to submit certain amount or certain percentage of their collection to the central government. They can keep all the revenue on their own. Mm -hmm. This is the original design. But the local government under this kind of system develop a different motivation. They want to leave more resources outside of the formal budgetary institution, Mm -hmm. rather than collect and share with the central government. So eventually, the government revenue, both for the central government and the local government, decline. So this is the unintended consequence of physical reform. And and, and then this... um these regional dis- disparities, I mean, uh, is the situation better now or is it still a problem? Uh, now, there's a Im- very important change since perhaps 2002. Mm-hmm. In the last eight, nine years, I think it has, has been a significant change. First of all, in 1999, central government began to address regional inequality regional inequality, the gap between the coastal area and the, the western area. It's called the Go West program. So the mm-hmm. government introduced that program. At that time, many people asked me, because I, I had a published book on regional disparities, they asked me, how long do you think the government policy will take effect? At that time, it was, I was a little pessimistic. I think I told them, perhaps take 30 years, 50 years for the situation to improve. The most, at the most, the, government, the best government can do was to slow in down, I mean, slow in down the process of growing inequality. Mm-hmm. I was wrong. I was proved wrong. Government policy was more effective than I had expected. Mm-hmm. By 2004, regional disparity began to narrow rather than continue mm-hmm. to grow. So today, regional gap today is much smaller than 2004, mm-hmm. perhaps than 1999. So government policy has important impact. Second, rural-urban divide. 
also in the last few years. The situation didn't improve, but it didn't de deteriorate. Mm -hmm. So more or less the same, the gap between the rural and the urban is more or less uh, the same. Uh, now, then, for instance, five, seven years ago, five, six, seven years ago. So that has stopped growing anymore. Mm -hmm. But in another two dimension, the gap, especially the gap among the re urban residents has been growing. Mm -hmm. The gap among the rural residents have been uh, narrowing. So full dimension of inequality, regional is diminishing. Mm -hmm. Rural urban gap is more or less the same. The gap within the rural area is diminishing. Gap within the urban area is growing. So that's the trend in the last mm -hmm. few years. And, and so, so, so when we talk about, in fact, the, the growing gap between rich and poor uh, today in, in China, I guess that we focus on the, the growing gap between rich and poor within urban areas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now there's a, there's a much bigger inequality among the urban residents. Now, of course, in the, in the last 30 years, every year, 1% of the population move into the city. 1% means perhaps 15 million people move into the city. Those people tend to be relatively poor. They come from the countryside. So that's also one of the factors contributing uh, into the growing inequality in the urban area. Now China has about 600 million people living in the city. This is a much bigger number than 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. China's urban population per se is twice the size of the population of the United States. The United States only have 300 million people, but China's mm -hmm. urban people already 600 million people. So the gap between urban residents has been growing. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way you are saying two things when it comes to this growing gap between rich and poor in urban areas. First of all, the gap has to do with the success of urban areas which attract a lot of people from rural areas and therefore somehow uh, leads to the, uh, deepening the gap between rich and poor, but also I guess there are probably a number of policies uh, targeting urban areas which account for uh, somehow deepening these uh, disparities by favoring perhaps uh, the upper middle class, uh, certain uh, types of occupations and so on. Uh, not, not that. Uh, I, I think a number of other reasons. One re reason is that China now have much bigger private sector than before. Yeah. Before 1979, 79, I'm talking about 15 years ago, 15 mm -hmm. years ago, the public economy, state-owned economy, or collective-owned economy still constitute about 75% of the economy, mm -hmm. 1979. Now the public economy only account for about 25% mm -hmm. of GDP. The, the distribution of income within the public-owned enterprise was much smaller. But the distribution of income within the private sector was much bigger, the inequality. So that's another factor contributing to the growing inequality among the urban population. And uh, you, you mentioned the tax uh, uh, policy. In China, most of the people don't pay any ta personal income tax. Only a, a small fracture of the population, urban population, pay taxes at all. Recently, China just changed its policy, uh, 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 individual income tax uh, policy, and the, the, the number of people who are supposed to pay tax become even smaller. So mm -hmm. fewer and fewer people are paying taxes. The new reform just introduced a couple of weeks ago would 
impose much, much higher tax rate on the rich people. And are now most of the, the low income people exemption. They don't have to pay any tax at all. The mm -hmm. people in the middle mm -hmm. also pay less tax now than before. Mm -hmm. So, so, so in fact, this uh, the, 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 the the tax issue is becoming a, a, a major tool in somehow uh, um, the evolving policies of development in in China. Uh, right, but the taxes. Um, this is a situation in the West, in mm -hmm. OECD country. In OECD country, for instance, uh, not market distribution of income was very unequal. Uh, mm -hmm. Even in Sweden. Uh, without a redistribution taxation and a redistribution market distribution of income, even in Sweden, was very unequal. But mm -hmm. after taxation and the transfer redistribution, the income distribution in Sweden, in France, in many countries substantially reduced. So yeah. taxation and the redistribution play very important role in OECD country. Mm -hmm. In China, even today. The total government revenue only account for 23-24% of GDP, all right? So income, personal income tax was not a very important source of taxation. This is very different from United States, from much of Europe, where the personal income tax was a very important source of revenue. In China, this is an unimportant source of revenue. In China, the most important source of revenue is a VAT, value added tax. In, in this is kind of a Euro, European type of uh, taxes, but the value added tax is discriminating against the poor people. Mm -hmm. This is a sales tax. Since poor people have to buy daily uh, essentials, daily necessities, so they have they in indirectly pay VAT. Poor people, they don't have to buy much, right? Uh, so therefore, proportionally, rich people pay less on yes. VAT. So yes. that's, in that sense, the taxation system in China is still not quite fair to the poor people. Yeah. So, so precisely, since you uh, talk about taxes, let's talk about the second topic of our conversation, uh, taxation, yes. because clearly this is uh, an area on which you have done quite a bit of work and, uh, and, and which you think is absolutely essential. So, so tell us a bit as a way to, to, to have the audience understanding, since uh, the differences are so big between uh, the uh, taxation system historically in China and the taxation systems in, in the West, be it in Europe and America. So tell us a bit about the uh, history of the taxation system in China, and, and why is it that uh, you know, all this led to the fact that uh, uh, historically income tax, as you said, was so low? Uh, you, you know, before economic reform, taxation was not important. At that time, most of the enterprise belonged to the state, the state-owned enterprise, mm -hmm. or their collectively-owned enterprise. So they don't have to pay tax. They just remit part of the revenue to the state. So it's called a profit remission to the state, not a taxation. Only after economic reform, China began to use taxation. State-owned enterprise no longer remit profit to the state. Instead, they pay taxes. Mm -hmm. Also, before economic reform, the people's income is, was very low. So there is no need to impose income tax on any people. And uh, there was no rich people anyway before economic reform. Therefore, there is no personal income tax. Mm -hmm. Until very recently, less than 0.1% of the population pay taxes. I mean. Less than 1% of people pay tax, taxes. Even today, it's barely 1% or 2% of the population pay income taxes. Most of the people in the countryside pay no personal income tax at all. Mm -hmm. Urban area 
only people's income higher than a certain threshold, they have to pay personal income tax. So that's the situation now. Hmm. And, and, and so uh, uh, earlier in our conversation, you talked about the fact that in the in the 90s, I guess it was a moment, uh, a moment of transition where things had to change a bit. There was uh, this, this, this situation in the context of which somehow the, 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 the taxation capacity of the Chinese states was the, the source of a problem. So why right. was it the case? Uh, I, I, I talk about the problem before middle of the 1990s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 1995 was in the worst year. Mm -hmm. I, as I said before, in 1995, government revenue only accounted for 10% of GDP. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, one year before, 1994, China introduced a new taxation system, 1994. Mm -hmm. This is a crucial year, 1994. Changing the rule of the game. Mm -hmm. And the divide in the taxation tax collection system into the central tax collection system and a local tax collection system. And now the government at all level to collect more taxes. So since 1995, the proportion of government revenue as a percentage of GDP has been growing. Yes. So from around 10%, now increased to 23, 24, perhaps 25%. Now, so the extractive capacity of the state has improved in the last 17 years. And, and so, and, and so, and it, it happened partly by somehow moving from central collection to local collection, right? Yeah, now the, the three types of taxes. Mm -hmm. One group of taxes are called central taxes. Mm -hmm. So central government are responsible for collecting those central taxes. Another group of taxes are local taxes. The local tax collection agency are responsible for that collecting them. The most important category of taxes is called shared taxes, shared between central government and local government. Mm -hmm. Normally, central government take majority share. Local government take minority share. This is a responsibility of a central tax collecting agency. In the past, it's a local government that collect tax and a share with the central government. Now it's a central government that collect taxes share with the local government. So this kind of incentive structure was much better than before. Mm -hmm. That explains mm -hmm. why the tax collection has improved substantially in the last uh, 17 years. Mm -hmm. But you, so, so you mentioned that it is now, it represents, uh, I mean, the, 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 the amount of taxes collected by the state represents 23% of GDP. So do you think that it is enough or do you think that, uh, uh, which, which is still quite low in a way? I mean, you know, so what would be the, 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 uh, uh, the goal for, for, for the years uh, to come? I, I, th I, I think perhaps it's still a little low. Mm -hmm. Not a very low, but still lower than most of the OECD countries, yes. uh, even lower than most of the developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, especially the central government share of this total is very low. Mm -hmm. The Chinese central government take about 53-54% of total government revenue. Mm -hmm. This is a very different from much of the European country where central government take 70, 80% of the revenue. China only 52, 53. Mm -hmm. Chinese central government spend even less. Central expenditure is even less. Chinese central government only spend 25% of total government revenue. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a very different from most of the European country, even United States. Mm -hmm. the the small share of the central government is a problem. If the share of the central government is larger, the central government should have a greater ability to redistribute resources from rich to the poor. Yeah. But now the central government is still relatively poor, therefore mm -hmm. they cannot do much redistribution. Of course, today, 
central government do more, much, much more retribution than 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. But there's still mm -hmm. much room to improve. So mm -hmm. I think, um, but I, I don't advocate grow at a very fast pace. The slow growth of tax revenue as a percentage of GDP is okay. It's mm -hmm. still growing. Mm -hmm. So now it's 23, 24. In five years, could be about 27, 28. I think by that time, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So China don't have, doesn't have to be uh, high in taxation. So mm -hmm. I think now it's okay. Improve a little bit uh, will be better. And, and, and so, so you, you, in a, in a way, you are telling us that uh, uh, local authorities uh, somehow collect more taxes than uh, uh, the central government. So, in terms of uh, uh, policies of, uh, you know, of redistribution policies uh, to be put in place on the basis of of these resources, do we have? I mean. This is a silly question, probably, I'm sure, but there is a, a dialogue between the, the local authorities and the central authorities to see, you know, to, to make sure that uh, there is coordination between these two levels. Yeah, the situation in China is, uh, is complicated. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to taxation, central government some, sometimes can ask rich provinces to help the poor regions. Mm -hmm. uh, you must know this the, the, the earthquake, huge mm -hmm. earthquake in 2008, yeah. devastated much larger part of the Sichuan province. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay? Then central government asked every another provinces to help the Sichuan province. Mm -hmm. And they, they have been doing very well, very good job. Now, central government asks rich provinces to help Xinjiang and Tibet. Mm -hmm. This is in addition to taxation. They have to use their own money to help Tibet and Xinjiang and Sichuan. So, mm -hmm. redistribution mechanism in China working quite differently from many countries in the world, mm -hmm. including in the Western country. So in addition to the physical redistribution, central government sometimes just ask rich mm -hmm. provinces to help. Okay, and, that's and, another mechanism of redistribution. Yeah, and and uh, it's an interesting point, and, and precisely, I mean, what is the incentive for the for the, the, the rich regions to help the poorer regions? And uh, uh, is it simply, you know, uh, uh, for reasons of, of, of patriotism or, you know, or for, for, for reasons of solidarity? What is the incentive for the, the rich think, regions to... Yeah, I, I think for the solidarity. I mean, the people understand the, the, the entire country is one family. If mm -hmm. one part of China is in trouble, and the whole country will be in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the best I can explain. I mean, and otherwise, you can hardly explain why this happened. And many, many provinces go much further than central government expected. If mm -hmm. you now visit those earthquake areas, you will see enormous improvement of infrastructure there. Those places were very backward before earthquake. Now they are much, much better. People say they are moving ahead 20 years, 30 years mm -hmm. within the space of one or two years. Mm -hmm. So this, is a, this shows many rich provinces are willing to go further than central government expected. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can only use the solidarity as an explanation. As an explanation, and, and you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, a few minutes ago that in fact, uh, very recently there was a change in the uh, tax system. So uh, right. can you tell us a bit about uh, the, 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 these changes? I mean, and, and what is the nature of the changes and uh, how significant are these changes? For, the, for the, most in, the, the most important change is there are two. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, in the past, is a kind of a tax contract system. 
central government sign kind of a tax contract with the lower level of government. Mm -hmm. Local mm -hmm. government can keep certain amount, certain percentage of their collection on their own. But now it's a tax sharing system, as I mentioned, the three mm -hmm. categories of taxes. So it's a much clearer definition of taxes. It's not tax contract anymore. Mm -hmm. Second, mm -hmm. the most important change is tax collection. In the past, tax collection is a responsibility of local government. So it's local government collect taxes first, then sharing upwards with the central government. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. much of the responsibility for tax collection is with the central government. Central government collect taxes first, then share with the lower level of government. Mm -hmm. Those two mm -hmm. change are extremely important. Change the incentive structure and improve extractive capacity of central state, central government. Mm -hmm. So so far we have uh, we have spoken about uh, we have talked about uh, uh, China how it has evolved and. Uh, uh, dealt with poverty in the past 30 years or so. Now, second aspect of our conversation, China and, and the world, if you will, and okay. what does okay. all these uh, changes in China mean uh, for, uh, for, for the world? F first of all, I mean, uh, you know, the, the impression that we have in the West, uh, especially in these days where we have this debt crisis in uh, in, uh, in, in America and, and in Europe, I mean, we, we have the impression that there is so much money uh, available in, in, in China. So how do we explain this huge amount, uh, amount of money available uh, in, in China today? I, I think that's perhaps a wrong impression. Ah, okay. <laughs> we don't feel really we have a lot of the money. Of course, only compared to China's own past, the country mm -hmm. now has more money. Mm -hmm. In a sense, China become much richer than it was before. If you use the official statistics, using the constant price to measure the size of the economy, today the size of the economy was about 18 times larger than 13 year, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, China become much richer compared to its own past. Mm -hmm. And uh, the absolute magnitude of the economy is large. Now rank number two after the United States, already overtaking Japan, right? Mm -hmm. Some people speculate that China will overtake the United States in a few years or mm -hmm. a couple mm -hmm. decades. So overall size is large. But remember, China has 1.3 billion people. <laughs> Divide by 1.3 billion population per capita GDP in China is still very low. Mm -hmm. Using the UN data, China still rank below 100. Mm -hmm. I mean, many countries, about more than 100 countries have higher per capita income than China mm -hmm. does, the Chinese mm -hmm. does. So China is not very rich uh, compared to most of the country. It's only compared its own past. China yes. is richer today than before. But but still there is, uh, uh, I mean, at least that's the impression that we have in the West, there is uh, uh, quite a bit of, of money available for at least uh, the strategic development of, of China. So these, uh, these resources, you know, when, when, we, when we talk about the economic situation in, uh, in Europe, in the US, you know, we're always talking about uh, the need to uh, restrict spending, reduce spending. Uh, and, and clearly, uh, you know, if, if you are constantly reducing spending, somehow strategic development uh, becomes a bit of a difficulty. You don't seem to have this problem. So all these resources available for strategic development, where do they come from? Is it investment? I mean, uh, foreign investment? Is it uh, domestic savings? The resources, where do they come from? Okay. Uh, very interesting. You, you mentioned people in Europe are now talk about the cutting the spending. Yes. But remember, yes. the people in Europe and North America talk about a spending cut only recently. Yes. I mean, for decades, they have spent and spent and spent. 
politicians make all kinds of promises to their population, right? To their people. Spend on this, spend on that. Only after a few decades, they realize they overspend themselves. Mm-hmm. But in China, I think China, because China has a long history of poor, being poor, therefore they are very careful. Not only country as a whole, even individual family are very mm-hmm. careful in their spending planning. I mean, they, they plan carefully. Don't spend all before, beyond your means. Okay, this is the kind of philosophy every child was taught in school and in family. So the, those people who manage state budget also follow this kind of philosophy. Mm-hmm. So that's why the deficit in China is rather small. Mm-hmm. And in the number of years, there's no deficit. Uh, the overall government debt is, is growing, but it's still manageable compared to most of the country. So that's why uh, China appear to have money. Mm-hmm. You ask where money comes from for the investment. Foreign investment was not important. Was not important. By 2009-2010, foreign investment only accounted for, for about 2% of mm-hmm. overall mm-hmm. capital formation. In other words, 98% of capital formation come from domestic sources. Mm -hmm. Domestic sources. Among the domestic sources, state budget was not important. Before economic reform, state budget was important for capital formation, but now no longer important, only about 5%. Mm-hmm. So 98% minus 5%, we are talking about 93% of the investment come from South Rising Fund or bank no. Mm-hmm. So mostly domestic, mostly non-government source of money for investment. So, so is it based on the domestic savings? Domestic savings, right. Mm-hmm. That's why China has been capital exporting country since 1990s. Mm-hmm. China invests more money outside than attract foreign investment. And, into China. Uh, yeah, and this domestic savings comes from from a private uh, uh, households, from from companies. I mean, you know, how do you generate these domestic savings? I, I, I think uh, all sources, uh, private households save a lot. Uh, in, in, I don't have the exact figure with me, but for a long time, many people save 10, 20, 30 percent of the income uh, in bank account, stock market, uh, that, uh, the bond market, uh, or real estate investment. So they, they save or not, individual household. The enterprise also save a lot of money. And I think now perhaps enterprise was the, the most important source of saving now. Mm-hmm. Uh, private and the public enterprise, they save money for the future investment. And, and, and so, so, uh, so you, you have these resources, and of course, you know, it's sometimes it's, it's not good not to have resources, and sometimes having a lot of resources is also a danger because then you really have to be careful how to uh, invest them properly so that you generate return investment so that the economy doesn't eat up. So, uh, are you, uh, I mean, uh, I understand that, for instance, uh, uh, prices of housing in China is booming. So are we uh, facing the possibilities of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a bubble economy in, in China? Or, uh, I mean, has it happened in Japan in the late 80s, early 90s? I mean, uh, yeah, uh, I think much of the report about the China's housing market in China and outside China, folks, uh, folks 
only on few major cities. Mm-hmm. Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, those cities. In those cities, the housing price was high and extremely high. I think even I cannot afford uh, mm-hmm. some, some of the new project. I mean, uh, they're extremely uh, expensive. But we have to remember, number one, China is a land scarcity. The country was land scarcity. So it's not much land. Population-wise, China accounts for more than 20% of the population. But China's arable land only accounts for 7% of the world total. So China is a country like of land. That mm-hmm. is an important fact of a growing price of housing. Mm-hmm. It's not a building material. It's the land price is growing. Okay, mm-hmm. this is a this is a fact that China cannot avoid. I mean, uh, is this is a uh, situation you can you have to face. It's not the United States. You have vast uh, uh, land. China doesn't have that kind of situation. Second, mm-hmm. in urban China, 85 percent of the household living in the apartment they have ownership. In other words, China is perhaps the country, the highest home ownership. In the United States, only about 65% of the population living in the apartment, they have ownership. But mm-hmm. in urban China, 85%. In countryside, 100%. So if you have overall home ownership rate, China is over 90%. Those people who want to buy new apartment, better apartment, they already have apartment. So they still have a choice to stay on. All right? This is the second fact. Third fact, the, the most important housing market is not in a major city. Rather, it's in hundreds of small and medium-sized city, and in tens of thousands of villages. Countryside, there's also the building boom in, mm-hmm. in China, all over, almost everywhere. I just come back from a trip to uh, Chongqing and uh, Sichuan, two uh, provinces which where per capita GDP is below national average. Even in the countryside, you see new building come up almost mm-hmm. everywhere. So that's the most, the largest market of a housing market, much larger than the market in Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, those large uh, metropolitan area. So mm-hmm. I don't think it is a bubble. Mm-hmm. I mean, the price there is quite com- affordable for the people. And otherwise, you wouldn't see so many buildings come up. Yeah. They, they, they cannot afford to just build a building, nobody move in. So for those places, I, d- I don't see any bubble. So if there are any bubble, it's only perhaps in you know, one or two or three mm-hmm. major mm-hmm. metropolitan areas, mm-hmm. not overall China. So mm-hmm. talking about the housing bubble, uh, I would say I cannot rule out the possibility, but I think it's highly, highly Unlikely. Unlikely. Uh, two follow-up questions. Uh, why mm-hmm. is it that uh, uh, home ownership is so much part of the uh, Chinese culture? Why is it so important to, to own a home? And, and second question, um, what, what about the quality of housing? I spent quite a bit of time in China, and I'm always amazed to see how quickly uh, new buildings get old buildings. That is to say, the, the quality of housing doesn't seem to be very strong. So, so first of all, why is it that the home ownership is so important? The the new, the quality of a new house, uh, pretty good. It, it's improving. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, pretty. Uh, it's improving and pretty good, comparable to you know, the quality, perhaps in much of Europe, even compared to United States. Yeah. I, I I I personally had a house uh, apartment in in Shenzhen. Many of my friends living in a new building, I, I know the quality is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good. The per capita, the floor space in urban China 
is nearly 30 square meter. Mm -hmm. 30 square meter is pretty good. I mean, yeah. compare, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, Hong Kong. Hong mm -hmm. Kong here, mm -hmm. uh, the, the floor space per capita is pretty small, much mm -hmm. smaller mm -hmm. than the neighboring city across border uh, uh, into the mainland. So the quality and the size of the, the housing for urban people has substantially improved. improved yeah. The countryside is also improved. You can mm -hmm. see the old house and the new house side by side. And you can tell how different, there's a vast differences in terms of quality and the size in the countryside. So I, I think uh, it's improving at a very fast pace. Uh, I, I don't know whether you have a chance to visit some friends in uh, urban China. You will be amazed. I mean, many people live uh, better perhaps than people in Paris, than yeah. in Berlin or in New York. Yeah. No, no, you are right. The, 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 the space is much better and, and absolutely. So then, and then other question. So why is it that uh, home ownership is so important? You say that 85 uh, percent of people in urban areas own their own place, 100 percent in the countryside. So why is it that uh, home ownership is so vital? Uh, before 1998, only about 30 percent of the uh, urban people living in an apartment, they have ownership. But in 1998, overnight, the government sold, the government owned the apartment to the resident themselves mm -hmm. at extremely mm -hmm. low price. Mm -hmm. it's, it's only the nominal price, extremely low. I mean, uh, almost it's a kind of a gift to those people. So mm -hmm. overnight, the percentage of people own apartment increase from 30% to 85%. Mm -hmm. So th that's what happened. It's a kind of a housing privatization overnight. Overnight, yes. Uh, <laughs> also, in, in your work, you, you, you talk about uh, a bit this, this, kind of, uh, this kind of paradox. On the one hand, you, 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 the, the political system seems to be a bit closed, and the economic system seems to be quite open. So how does it... How does it go together? Uh, what do you mean by the closeness? Well, I, 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 I don't think I talk about that. No, no but uh, you, know, you, 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 uh, you, um, you, you, you mentioned that the, uh, the Chinese economy has been very, very open. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yes, yeah, so, and, and, and it's really one of the features uh, of, uh, of the past 30 years. Yeah, but I, 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 that's my argument. The Chinese mm -hmm. economy is extremely open. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of trade going on. Uh, trade has become a very important part of the economy. China also uses the foreign investment. Mm -hmm. Even though mm -hmm. the proportion is very low, but uh, the overall size is pretty large. China, mm -hmm. for a number of years, was the number one foreign uh, direct investment designation sometimes number two after the United States. So mm -hmm. it's extremely open, mm -hmm. even compared to a uh, country like the United States and the Japan. Mm -hmm. The foreign trade, the share of foreign trade in the economy is higher in China than the United States and than in Japan. Remember, China is a large country. For small economy, mm -hmm. and the high trade uh, uh, Renounces is understandable. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, mm -hmm. Scandinavia country they are highly rely upon the trade. Hong Kong highly rely upon the trade. Large country tend not to rely much upon the trade, but China was the exception. So it's very open. Buy a, a great deal from outside and sell a great deal into another country. So it's quite open. Particularly, I don't. If you ask me to define what is closed, what is open, yeah. I would say if a system is willing and capable of learning from others, it's yeah. open. Yeah. Yeah. If a system is not willing or capable of learning from another, it's closed. Mm -hmm. By that criterion, I wouldn't say China is closed. China is quite open as well. Yeah. 
No, in, in China, China is very much willing to learn, and China has been showing its capacity to learn. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, you know, it's a combination of uh, of uh, uh, commitment to certain principles and also, you know, uh, a huge amount of pragmatism and and uh, learning by uh, you know trying things and it works, it works, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and we try something else. Right. Many people now use the term adaptive capacity, whether mm -hmm. a system can adapt to the new situation. Uh, facing new challenges. I think that China has been doing pretty well uh, to, on those fronts. China is capable of learning, China is capable of adapting to the new situation. Uh, otherwise, it's pretty hard to explain why China has achieved so much yeah, no, in the last decades. No, no, precisely. And so in, in the West, once again, we have all these debates on uh, the beneficiaries of, uh, of Chinese development. I mean, clearly, China has uh, benef benefited immensely from, uh, and it's only uh, natural that it has been the case, of, of its own development. Do you think that also the world is benefiting from the, 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 the development of China? For instance, in, in the US and in Europe, very often people who are in favor of protectionism always arguing that somehow jobs are being outsourced to, to China. But you also have other people saying that you know, the development of China also benefits uh, the development of, of, of the developed world. So, so how would you argue about these debates? Yeah, I, I think uh, China's development is a mutually beneficiary to the people around the world. Mm -hmm. Let me make a, some distinction. One is the country, China's neighboring country. I mean, mostly Asian country, the country in Asia. Those countries definitely benefit from China's development. If you compare the trading balance sheet, China import much, much more than China export to its neighboring country. And China now has the free trade zone uh, agreement with quite a number of countries in Asia. So. Mm -hmm. Many countries around China benefit from, from this because mm -hmm. they export more than they import from China. Second category of country is a country with resources, with resources, natural resources. Mm -hmm. I meant number one is Latin America. Number two is uh, Australia, New Zealand, oceanary country, okay? Mm -hmm. They also export more to China than import from, from China. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Latin America and uh, Australia New Zealand benefit a great deal, the country of resources. The country of investors, namely United States and uh, Europe, they also benefit. Of course, not a benefit everyone in those countries, but at least benefit those investors, yeah. the multinationals. They benefit. China trades a great deal, but much of the trade is internal trade between branches of multinationals. Mm -hmm. Okay, it appear to be trade from between China and the United States, but often is trade within the same company, okay? So definitely for those investors, they benefit. Also, they are country of consumers. I mean, you mentioned United States and Europe. I think people with no income perhaps also benefit because you can buy high quality product with no price. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the United States, I, I just come back from New York uh, not an hour ago. I, I found uh, some Chinese export sold selling price was extremely attractive. I mean, in the United States, mm -hmm. without this kind of import, it, it wouldn't be possible. I mean, if you only buy made made in USA, then mm -hmm. the price would be much much higher. Uh, uh, in Europe and Japan, I think more or less the same. So consumer also uh, benefit a great deal. Finally, China now become second largest importing country 
only after United States. China import a great deal, and the import means country and elsewhere create not of job opportunities. Okay, mm -hmm. so overall, I would say it's a mutually beneficiary to China and the world. But if we analyze in more deeply fashion, then we will see some segment of the population benefit more yeah. than another. Some uh, segment of the population pay more prices than others. Yeah. So it's not quite uh, 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 the fair game. Yeah, yeah, no, actually, yeah, as you know, I mean, you know, you know the U.S. very well. I mean, you know, very often uh, the the conservative elements in in America, and you also hear this in in Europe. You know, they will say, you know, the 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 rise of the middle class in in China means the fall of the middle of the middle class in Europe and in in China. The rise of the working class in in China means the the fall of the working class in China uh, in Europe and in America. So, what do you think of this argument? Is it a fair argument, or...? Uh... Uh, it, it, this is also happening inside of China. Mm -hmm. If the, the working class who are just uh, assembling cars into some final product, these people are losing out. They have mm -hmm. become not competitive because their salary has been growing, their, their income level is higher than many people in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Philippines, Thai, uh, 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 and uh, Malaysia. So those people inside China are also losing out. Mm -hmm. they, have to, they have to be able to learn the new skill in order to face the new challenges. I think the working class in China and the working class in Europe, in the United States, face the same type of challenges. Mm -hmm. You have to move to a higher working scale in different types of industry. Of course, this is also the responsibility of government. To what extent the government can facilitate him, this kind of a transformation is also important. So provide a learning opportunity for those people uh, in school, before working and after the kind of a learning for life mm -hmm. is also mm -hmm. important. So this is not a uniquely European phenomena or American phenomena. In China, this is also happening. Many but, but people so, felt, uh, no, 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 felt no, no, they no, no, are victims. No, no. No, 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 absolutely. But of course, you see, it's, uh, the question is how do you uh, manage the transition? Because to retrain people and to, in fact, uh, uh, invent the markets and the, 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 the industrial settings for these people to really uh, find uh, meaningful uh, ways of, 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 of working and so on, it takes a long time and, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years. So how do you manage economically, socially, and politically the, the transition? Right. right, right. I think this is a challenge I think every country is facing. It's, it's not uh, uh, Europe, Europe, uh, Europe, United States. Mm -hmm. It's not only China. I think sooner or later, India will face this kind of problem. I mean, uh, only uh, uh, people with a certain skill are, are paid uh, 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 decently, but the people without much skill, they don't, they are not paid very well. This is a situation everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, mean, especially in those economy which focus on the services. Mm -hmm. I mean, the service sector is in the sector where the internal diversity was huge. It's different from the manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong is a, is a very good example. Uh, 70, 80 percent of the economy of Hong Kong is a service. In, income inequality in Hong Kong is extremely high. A higher even, this is a city of 7 million people. The degree of inequality in Hong Kong city is uh, worse than inequality degree in China as a whole. So one of the reasons is this is a service. I mean, the people working in the banking sector can 
make huge amount of money. But the people who, who are selling McDonald's, they don't have much money. This is just like in the United States and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So this is a challenge every country is facing. It's not just any uh, country, a country for any particular country. And so perhaps uh, as we are reaching the end of our conversation, I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, two questions. How do you see the, 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 the future of the, of the Chinese economy and of its uh, interactions with the world for the 10 years uh, or 20 years to come? And, and secondly, what are the issues on which you are uh, doing research uh, currently and what is your research agenda for the coming uh, years? Uh, let me talk about uh, my research agenda first, uh, okay. then answer your, your uh, uh, earlier question. My, uh, in, in 1990s, I published a great deal criticizing the Chinese government uh, for having only economic policy without much social policy in the 1990s. Now, especially since 2002, China has begun to introduce all kinds of social policies. Let me give you one example, mm -hmm. healthcare. Mm -hmm. In late 1990s, most of the people in China, I mean both in this rural China and urban China, didn't have healthcare. Chinese government at that time seemed to have intention to marketize the health care. Whoever, who can, whoever can pay for health care, they will get health care. If you cannot pay, that's your own problem. So mm -hmm. that's the situation in late 1990s. Since late 1990s, the situation has changed a great deal. By now, over 95% of the population have some kind of health care in China. This is the largest health care reform in history and in the world. I mean, from very small percentage of the population to over 95% of the population. Mm -hmm. In a couple years, I'm pretty sure 100% of the population will be covered health care. Mm -hmm. This is not yet perfect health care. There's still a great deal of a problem. But this change itself is very significant. Second, education. In late 1990s, even though China has compulsory education, but the people have to pay. The price was pretty high. But now compulsory education become free, free of charge. People don't have to pay. And in the countryside, the, the, the children even receive subsidies for food and uh, lunch. Many people living uh, now attending kind of a boarding school. It's not an American New England yeah. type of a boarding yeah. school, but nevertheless, they live in a, in a, a school. They don't have to travel back and forth, uh, family and a school, because in the countryside, sometimes it takes a long time to travel. So government sponsor subsidize those kind of a boarding school for the countryside kids. This is significant. Third, Chinese government now just made the pitch to provide old age pension for everyone. Mm -hmm. Old age pension for everyone. So in one sentence, China within the space less than 10 years introduce largest scale welfare reform in human history. But not much attention have been paid into this development. I think this is what's of study. I have done some research in this area. I'm, I'm going to continue to do research in this area. I think this is significant. Now, back to your earlier question. Uh, uh, future China and the world. I think this is a change, <clears throat> the change I just mentioned is important. Another important change is also worth a lot of attention. For 
first two decades of economic reform, coastal provinces grow much, much faster than inland provinces. So that's why the gap between coastal provinces and the inland provinces was growing in the 1980 and the 1990. But in the last several years, situation reversed. Inland provinces now grow much faster than coastal provinces. So you can expect the gap between rich provinces and the poor provinces will become even smaller. Why? One of the reasons is a significant improvement of infrastructure. Infrastructure like railway, highway, rural, rural road. You may not be able to imagine since 2003, the total length of a rural road more than doubled in China. So now you can travel to almost all the county and all the village by car. By car. By car. So that's why the production costs become much lower. Transportation costs become much lower for central and western provinces. And the neighbor cost there was low. So that's a big attraction from investment mm -hmm. from coastal to inland. And that's why there's a reverse of the trend. Mm -hmm. Inland provinces grow much faster. Mm -hmm. Another fact, when we talk about China depend upon the foreign trade, the real situation is only seven provinces rely upon foreign trade. Seven provinces of foreign trade almost account for 90% of China's foreign trade. China has 20, 31 provinces. 31 minus seven, we still have 24 provinces. They don't rely upon the foreign trade. So in other words, we see a transformation of the growth pattern from relying upon trade to rely upon domestic consumption. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a, another significant change. At those three change in China, from economic policy to social policy, mm -hmm. welfare reform. Second, growth pattern from coastal to inland. And another growth pattern from trade dependency to domestic consumption driven mm -hmm. growth. Those change are important for China and for the world. Mm -hmm. And for the world. So a great deal of opportunities from the country which you have experience in welfare, which you have experience in developing economy depend uh, uh, developing economy rely upon domestic consumption. Also the country with the experience of a balanced development. So opportunity for another country, there's abundant opportunity for another country. So that's why I, 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 I'm hoping for the best for both yeah. China and the full rest of the world. And the West. What you said about moving from economic policies to social policies and, and, and uh, what you mentioned regarding uh, you know, this uh, most important uh, uh, social reforms happening uh, in terms of uh, healthcare system, in terms of education, in terms of pension systems, it's interesting because you see China is going in a direction which is totally different from the one than uh, we are witnessing uh, in Europe and in America where somehow we, we feel that uh, uh, going private is the way to go. Uh, so, so, so and, and, and you know we have all these debates in the U.S. on on healthcare reform and uh, how do you explain such a, uh, such a choice in in China, uh, which you know in my view seems seems to be the way to go. Uh, this is a this is an extremely important question, an interesting question, but it's not easy to answer. I I conduct comparison 
research comparing healthcare reform in China and healthcare reform in the United States.、Mm-hmm. Okay, China formally launched healthcare reform 2006.、Mm-hmm. Even before 2006, there are already some change. But formally launch healthcare reform 2006, finish by 2009. Okay, United States talking about healthcare reform for decades. Yes. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. China within the three years, the framework was set up. One of the most important region is a special interest didn't have much impact、yes. on decision making. In United States, special interests have enormous impact on any policy making. But in China, at least in my case study of healthcare reform, I see some evidence. Special interests try to influence decision making, but they didn't have much impact on decision A.、Mm-hmm. So, in other words, the overall interests of the people were more important and taken into the consideration in the process of healthcare reform. I think that's quite important. Another reason, of course, is China didn't have much healthcare, state-sponsored healthcare before.、Mm-hmm. I'm not saying China didn't have any healthcare before. China had some kind of health、uh, welfare before. Welfare provided mostly by work unit, the the place you work. If you work for school, school provide welfare. If you work for the factory, factory provide welfare. That's the situation before economic reform. The system work fine, very well, working very well. All of the work unit belong to the state. They don't care about the profit, so no problem for them to provide the employee welfare. But after economic reform, those enterprise become Privatize, and many, even this, they are still public owned, but they become private driven enterprise. So they lost interest incentive to provide health healthcare or another welfare to their employee.、Mm-hmm. That's why China transformed itself from unit based welfare to state sponsored welfare. Mm-hmm. This is a significant change. It causes great transformation. This is a really great transformation、mm-hmm. taking place only in the last decades.、Mm-hmm. And and as as、uh, China becomes、uh, you know a more and more capitalist country, I mean, do you feel that、uh, the 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 way that、uh, special interests are, for instance, in America, do you feel that we're gonna we we're gonna be witnessing The, the 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 weight of similar、uh, special interest and and which could somehow you know constrain、um, putting in place、uh, public good policies. Very good question. I can only speculate. I think there's a great possibility. The special interests, the private business, they may become so entrenched. And so powerful, one day they may have greater impact on policy making than today. So this is the possibility, but I hope that wouldn't happen. I hope the the government, the party, and the people still have the willingness and the capability to resist this kind of a trend. But uh, uh, you are right. There's a possibility, special interests. May grow in and more influential. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people argue, but for instance, in the context of the U.S., the fact that the private sector or that uh, 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 special interest dominates the political system, finances the political system, accounts for the fact that very often legislation is drafted with in mind more the interest of the special interest than、uh, in mind the 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 the, the people interest. Well, on the other hand, one could argue that the fact that in China the political system somehow dominates and manages and rules the private sector,、uh, you know, makes right, it more difficult. It, 
Right. In the United States, the, the two mechanisms which are now in the special interest being powerful. One is the election. I mean, the mm-hmm. uh, special interest group donate a lot of campaign money for the candidate. Okay. Second is uh, all kinds of the, the, the lobby groups, the, the, especially those groups on K Street in Washington, D.C. I mean, they're extremely powerful. And uh, re- remember, many lobbyists are former congressmen. I mean, in a recent year, 30, 40, 50 percent of a retiring congressmen moving into the lobby firm. So they become extremely powerful. Those two mechanisms doesn't exist in China. Not yet, at least. We don't have that kind of expensive election. We don't have the lobby group. Law doesn't allow the lobby group to, to exist. So, so far, we don't have those two things. Mm-hmm. But in the United States, they're extremely powerful.